Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Isn't that good to kind of know that? And I hope you can respond to that and hear that and, and allow it to be um, moments of real truth in your heart, in your mind, and in real realities of your life. That there is a God who loves you actively, actively pursues you. That is good news. Those are moments of, amen, pastor, or amen, Jessica, thanks for singing. You know, those are the real realities of why we even choose to gather for the absolutely undefined, unreal love that God has. That a guppy type of love. We are in week three of this sermon series of the Jesus that I never knew. And this week, we are talking about becoming and being a part of the family of God. So as we think about this, so churches commonly refer to themselves. This is not mind-boggling information that I'm going to give you. This is not unfamiliar types of information. You ready? More than likely, you've entered into a house of worship at some point, sometime in your life, and you've heard a church mention this phrase. We commonly call ourselves the church family. That makes sense, right? Like, that's not like, oh, I've never heard that term. Oh, I've been wondering what you guys call yourself. This language, when we use this language, church family, um, expresses warmth acceptance that many people hope to experience, use that word right there, hope to experience within a group of people, within the congregation. The language of church family, though, it has its limitations, but it also challenges the consumerism of the modern North American church. Consider, for instance, the language of, maybe you've heard of this before, maybe you've been a part of this before, church hopping or church shopping. Would anyone shop for a new family? <laughs> it's unlikely. As Pamela Palmer writes, a church family is a community of people that attend a church together. More than that, a church family shares in the fullness of faith and life together. Yeah, they do life together. It's not just like how I want it or how you want it. We, we do it as a group. Amongst Jesus' more uncomfortable words are those about the family. On several occasions, when you read in Scripture, when you look throughout the Scriptures, Jesus almost seems to disregard his biological family, even at times setting them aside in order to embrace other followers to come through. The presence of his family members all the way to the cross, though, suggests that Jesus is not disregarding them, He's not kicking them to the side like, oh, that's Uncle so-and-so, and we don't talk about, what's that, what's that movie? We don't talk about Bruno. Um, we're, not, we're not doing those things. Instead, they're expanding on our understanding of the bonds that instead tie us together. It was a really risky thing to do. Maybe you're a movie person. Maybe you're a car person. Maybe you've watched the like 800,000 Fast and Furious movies that like this actor Vin Diesel put together. And often the key word in those movies is, it's about family. Or like maybe like any one of those mafia movies that you've seen, it's about family. Then as now, family is considered by most people to be one of the highest obligations that you have. The familiar story of the boy Jesus in the temple in Luke chapter 2 
verses 41 to 50, concludes with Jesus' first regard, uh, recorded words as he wonders why his parents were looking for him. It says, did you not know I must be in my father's house? While there is some question as to whether Jesus was saying he needed to be involved in his father's business or to be found in his house, what doesn't change is the identification of God rather than Joseph as his father. At the same time, though, he recognizes Joseph's authority by humbly submitting to his parents and returning home. His statement isn't intended to reject Joseph, but rather to signal the quality of his relationship with God. This pronouncement shows Luke's readers that Jesus possessed a very unique type of relationship <laughs> with God and confirms the message that the angels even shared. Jesus is, in fact, God's son. This unique relationship comes into play again when Mary and Jesus' brothers appear to lay special claim on Jesus' attention and time. So you find that again in Luke chapter 8, all right, verses 19 to 21. Jesus rejects such an assumption by making a broader claim. The presence of his brothers is a challenge for some given um, to the Roman uh, Catholic position, uh, Mary's perpetual virginity, okay? Mary was not a perpetual virgin. They are, are, in fact, siblings to Jesus. A broader interpretation simply assumes that these were children born to Joseph and Mary after Jesus' birth, which, again, it makes sense. Jesus is best understood to be saying, my real mother and brothers are not just or not my physical kin, but rather those who hear and do God's word. Amen. Ooh. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ and the Father are one. We start entering into this Trinity type of language. And that he is also the only begotten Son of God. This familiar term indicates God regards Jesus as a family member. Maybe you've heard this term before, to be born again. Born again believers are told that we too are members of this family of God. How do we become a part of this family of God? When we hear the gospel, we confess our sins, and place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, guess what happens? You get to be born again. Nicodemus is a funny guy. Maybe you've read those words and he starts to question this idea. It's kind of gross when he does it, though. He's like, what do you mean I'm going to be born again? Am I to crawl back in the... That's disgusting. Stop. <laughs> Stop. That's not what we're talking about. At that moment, we are born into God's kingdom and his children and become heirs with him. Heirs, as in those who share in the whole family stuff with him for eternity. While Jesus Christ is referred to as the only begotten Son of God, believers are referred to as children born into God's family. Who need to grow. We need to. We need to grow and we need to mature in our faith. As sons and heirs and daughters adopted into the family of God. God's infinite grace and mercy are revealed in the words of Ephesians chapter 1 verses 5 and 6. Which says, he redeems sinners whom he has adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasures and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us, the ones he loves. That's the word of the Lord. 
As children of God, what do we get to inherit? Nothing less than the kingdom of God. That's good news. If you were looking for anything. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 tells us that believers are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. These spiritual blessings are infinite. They're eternal. And by God's grace, we are given these blessings as his actual children. Yay. That's good to know. As earthly children, we eventually inherit what our parents leave behind for us after their death. But in God's case, believers are already reaping the rewards of our inheritance. Hey, Amen. It's kind of like that story of you know, this parable son who ran off and the father wasn't even dead. He asked for that inheritance, but like we're telling it in a different way. We are reaping the rewards of our inheritance by having peace with him through the sacrifice of his son on a cross. Other rewards of our inheritance include the gift of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's a good gift. A God that lives and walks with us. Amen. Which empowers us to live for him in the actual present and the knowledge that our salvation is secure for eternity as we live with him. Being a part of the family of God is the greatest blessing bestowed upon believers and one that should drive us to our knees continually. Not in pain, but in gratitude. In reflection that God is good. We can never do anything to deserve it. We heard that in a song really recently. It is for as it is because of his gift of love and mercy and grace to us. Yet we are called to become sons and daughters of the living God. Praise God. We are all in an invitation to respond in faith to his grace. In the last few years, the media has given attention to the notion of a chosen type of family with traditions that are called such things as Friendsgiving. You ever heard that term? Friendsgiving is gaining momentum. Friendsgiving acknowledges that friendships may offer the kind of closeness many crave but don't actually experience within their biological senses of family. It's family created. The Today Show, back in like 2018, which, believe it or not, is years ago at this point, um, but it, f it made a feature on Friendsgiving. And it goes, to, uh, goes as far as to cite claims that friends are, in fact, the new family. Jesus made a not altogether different claim by acknowledging all fellow believers as his brothers and sisters. All believers are part of the family of God. Sometimes it can be confusing to decipher what it means to be a part of the family of God. Though. Remember, we mentioned it before, like, how do I become part of the family of God? Here are the ways. Hear the truth. Know the truth. Bring in the truth. Live the truth. That makes you a family member. Individuals are born into blood relatives. However, being a part of the family of God goes well beyond any ties of blood. Amen. Being a part of the family of God means God is, in fact, your heavenly father and resting in that knowledge. Amen. So here's the truth. Some of us come from really great family systems. Some of us don't. Some of us have a really messy family system. Some of us are missing our family systems. We miss our fathers. We miss our mothers. We miss our aunts, uncles, and etc. This is the family of God. Oh, we are 
sons and daughters of the king. These are lyrics to a, a song from the newsboy, Family of God. And I was, as I was working through some of this stuff, there was, I, I, was, I didn't know right off the back that we were going to have Jessica's wonderful special music today, but like, I almost tried to edge on Larry to do like a Gaither song. It was called Family of God that I kind of listened to on repeat for a little bit. And I was like, ah, oh, that's just nice too. You know, it was, it was, there's tons of songs about being a part of the family of God. I'm so thankful that we get to uh, receive the blessing, Jessica, of hearing about like, this reckless love of a God that is like undefined, unheld in, breaking all walls and chains down. I thank you. God created every single person in this world. This isn't. Crazy information, but it's true. However, not all people are a part of the family of God. Only those who place faith in Jesus Christ become part of the family of God. John chapter 1, verses 12 to 13 says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. Amen. Broken homes, hatred between family members, or never even knowing your parents can cause an individual to be super skeptical of the idea of family. It's often why, like, as, as pastors, as communicators, sometimes we... Sometimes I even try to steer away from even using words like Heavenly Father because of the hurt that others have experienced from an earthly father or the unknowing of an earthly father. In God's family, there is no abandonment, hatred, or abuse. You're welcome. That's big stuff. That's really big stuff. In the family of God, in the actual family of God, you and your relationship with God, with Him, as your Heavenly Father, there is no abandonment. Amen. There is no hatred. And there is no abuse. That's the kind of love that He has for you. Only type of relationship that you get to find there? Love. Forgiveness. And grace that abides within God's family. He will never cast you out. Amen. These are like interactive moments, just so you know. Okay? He will never cast you out. Amen. He will never turn you away. Since we have God as our Father, we can freely talk to Him anytime we want. God is the Holy Trinity, which is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons, one God. As children of God, we can pray, we can talk, we can interact, we can receive, we can be apart anytime, anywhere, for whatever reason. You don't even have to have super elegant words. Sometimes the only word you need is thank you. Or sometimes all you need to do is live in gratitude. Lengthy prayers, rehearsed words in order for God to hear you, not real. You don't need it. Jesus' death on the cross enables us to become children of God. If it were not for, for Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, we would not be children of God. This is something worth reflecting on as we owe our entire beings to Christ. That's a big deal. It is only by his mercy that we are privileged to spend an eternity with him. God loves us so much that he was willing to send his own son we know, as believers who come here, but maybe it's the first time you've ever heard that. Maybe you are trying to respond to this and go, 
I'd like to believe that. Or, I wish I didn't have to believe that. But there is no greater love than the love God has for his children. Maybe your father, your mothers, or siblings did not treat you very well growing up. Even if our earthly families have hurt us, abandoned us, we know, and maybe you don't know, so maybe you maybe can send this home for you. God never will. It's both encouraging and frustrating. Because we wish that we can, like, as believers, or just not even as believers, but just as people, like, could go through life and not have to experience the real damage that family systems can cause. And it's not particularly always encouraging. Even though there is real truth in the fact that God will not leave me or abandon me, what about those times when I feel that way? Is anybody going to validate my feelings of abandonment? I may say yes, but I'll also remind you this. I know, but. It's in, in Scripture, but God. Like, levels into those things and says, I know. Actually, my plan for the world wasn't this. But know that my love is here for you. In Psalms 27.10, it tells us, Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. God will never forsake you, and he can be fully, fully trusted. Amen. If you were born into a broken home, or maybe you never even knew your parents, rest in the knowledge that you have, dear child, a father who loves you dearly, as well as millions of brothers and sisters in Christ. Every Christian you know and every Christian in the world is part of the family of God, including you. After moving through a dozen different foster homes and group homes during our childhood, uh, Tori Hope Peterson found God to be the father she could finally trust. The, the name of this person again, it, it's actually interesting. There's a, there's a nice article that she wrote. Uh, I encourage you to check it out. I'm not going to read the entire article because it's a little long, but her story is really cool. Tori Hope Peterson, if you feel like writing it down and looking it up on your own. But she found God to be the father she could finally trust. Here's a small clip of what she wrote. In the end, the father I always wanted turned out to be the father who was always there. The father who revealed himself to me in his own perfect timing. Tori, uh, Tori Hope Peterson. Again, if you want to, check her out. We are all familiar with the concept of family. But family can be way more than just some sort of um, biological group of people that you are related to. At first, your family is likely the people who raised you or were around when you were growing up. But as you progress through life, family might be someone who you have had many different experiences with. I have a lot more cousins than I do biological cousins. I have a lot more aunts than I have biological aunts and uncles. It's a term of endearment in my household. Someone who accepted you or a group who has supported you. Family doesn't have to have a DNA mass, a match. It can be an individual or a collection of people whom you love and whom you value. We see family as a physical thing. But can people also become our spiritual family? The very short, quick answer to that is a duh and a yes. <laughs> Those are people who have valued and added to your life, not just on a tangible level, but on a spiritual level. A spiritual family challenges you. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. It is important to have the influence of people who challenge you. 
to think and does not let you just fall into some sort of cookie cutter Christian culture where everyone looks and talks and smells the same or has the same type of vibe. This kind of community can allow for only shallow types of discussion without encouragement or analytical or diverse or spiritual discussions that are deeply rooted and pulled apart. And sometimes when we're thinking about our faith, we have to replant a plant. And we actually have to root up a plant that has outgrown its current little thingy. True sharpening of iron requires friction, sparks, and pressure. This does not sound like someone who strays strictly inside a comfort zone or within the confines of a group who are just like them. During the 2020 presidential election, the term purple church became widely more understood. This simply means that half the church votes blue and the other half votes red, blending the communities into a lovely shade of purple. Mm. The gospel of Christ does not have a political party. Right. Sorry. You might. Not the kingdom. Not the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ is not a certain color. The gospel of Christ does not have a last name or an affiliation or a brand. A spiritual family supports you. Now Jesus' mothers and brothers came to see him but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. And he replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Amen. Life can be really messy. You know what I mean? It can get really messy. Family relationships become estranged, or even ended due to abuse, lack of boundaries, and a variety of reasons. Often, we do not know where to turn for help. This is one of the arenas a mature spiritual family can support you. A spiritual community can be there through the birth of a child, through an illness, through a divorce, or even when you purpose to give up. When you have given up on the idea that drugs and alcohol need to be a part of your life. This is where a spiritual family comes into play as well. When you need counsel on a difficult life decision, where do you turn? I would assume probably to someone who you consider wise or maybe a person with spiritual insight. Having a healthy spiritual family surrounding you can be a boom to the turmoil that life really does bring our way. It's this, not just even a prayer, it's this conversation that I've had with certain family members in my life who have just experienced so much turmoil and have tried to fill it in with all sorts of different things to try to fit these different pieces in, I get it. And not in a cocky way, because I promise this is, I promise this is in a cocky sense, but I say, are you willing to try something different? Are you willing to try this like God-shaped piece because there's a God-shaped hole that's missing within you? Are you willing to try this? So in Christ, though many form one body and each member belongs to the other, when functioning perfectly, optimally, a spiritual family can be a peek into what eternity looks like in a fully good functioning church where we are active believers responding to the word of the Lord. That's a special glimpse into what heaven can look like. The definition of family in recent years has come into much debate with the rise of unexpected DNA discoveries due to those like at home 23andMe tests like Surprise! You're, you actually haven't been Welsh. You're German. <laughs> now you know. While family may need to decide and define by the individual, it often comes down to this. Who has supported you? 
Who is willing to step up and who is willing to make a sacrifice for you? A spiritual community who supports, steps up, and sacrifices for each other is in fact living out true Christianity. This can be your family. I believe it says something like that in the back of our bulletin. Or the front, somewhere on our bulletin. We can be your family. Or we can be your home. May we truly be this for one another. Can we stand as we pray in closing? Father, we thank you. We thank you for you are really good. We thank you for the truth that you lay out for us. That we can be one collective body. That no matter how much messiness, and there's a lot of messiness when it comes to what we might consider biological family. May we rejoice in the adopted family of Christ. May we find hope and truth in the reality of your agape, reckless love. Father, we thank you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.